time. It is always a pleasure to be here today to update you on the um, many great projects underway, all of which are contributing to what may well be a record level of investment in Evansville. Bravo to all of you for contributing to the business success of Evansville. From my perspective on Main Street, I sense a strong confidence in our local and regional economy. That confidence breeds investment and expansion. The unemployment rate is amazingly low, which is leading to workforce challenges that are being addressed by your Southwest Indiana Chamber, the Economic Development Coalition of Southwest Indiana, and the Growth Alliance, and many others. We have a new city branding campaign that is not only boosting city pride, but also making a bold, aspirational statement that Evansville is indeed a city for everyone. If you haven't been to the ES for Everyone website lately, I encourage you to do so the next time you're on the web. You'll find incredible stories of success, and you can learn how your business or your organization can join our effort in celebrating Evansville. Okay, so as Luke said, uh, we're going to do a little different format, and we hope this works, so bear with us. When we started planning this event, we thought we'd take a different strategy, and just instead of me standing up here speaking alone for an hour, no, just kidding, uh, we thought we'd ask some key department heads to come up and do a slightly deeper dive into some really big, important projects that are going on in the city. Uh, Kelly Coors could not be with us today, so playing the part of Kelly Coors today will be City Engineer Brent Schmidt. So if you would join me in welcoming Alan Mounts, Brent Schmidt, and Brian Holtz to the stage. $729 million in the next two and a half decades to upgrade our sewer system. What we are finding out with our first several construction projects is that our planning level estimates that are part of the consent decree are now outdated. And that means projects are going to cost more than we originally planned. So as a result, uh, when I was in Washington uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I met with the EPA and I alerted them that we would begin the process of reopening our consent decree. Uh, we will ask for a smaller investment, which most likely translates to smaller projects, while still meeting the demands of the Clean Water Act. Uh, we have no idea how long this process will take, and actually we don't have any idea if we will be successful or not, but we feel compelled uh, to start the process. In the meantime, we will continue to proceed with the elements of the plan and make financial adjustments accordingly. So, more to come on our efforts to reopen the consent decree. Alan, uh, let's talk about a project that almost everyone, well, they know more by the smell than the sight, probably. B. Slu. So, B. Slu is uh, uh, the largest component of the long term control plan. Uh, there's the first project related to that is the Cass Avenue Interceptor and Retaining Wall. You've probably seen this work underway. Uh, this is actually B. Slu right along here. The Cass Avenue Interceptor is right up here, and Alan's going to talk more about that. But you may have seen a video that we posted recently updating the status of the project. It just so happened that, that it was pouring down the rain the day we did the video, uh, which really provided great evidence as to why that project is needed. So, Alan, let's jump in and talk about uh, the Cass Avenue Interceptor in the retaining wall. Happy to do that. Um, just a, a tidbit for you, the b Slow is a concrete channel that really flows from the east side of town. It's, it's a mile in length. And over the next 20 years, we'll, we'll have projects that will touch almost every part of that. One of the most visible projects right now has been um, the interceptor, as you said. An interceptor is a large sewer line. It's a 60 inch sewer line that we've installed. And really, the objective is to drain the slough whenever the river's up. The levee closes at a gate, and there's nowhere for that water to go to. So, what we'll do is we'll be able to bypass that, pump it back over to the wastewater treatment, and process it there. 
the, there are several different features to the slough. It runs from Shawnee Drive back about 3,000 feet in total length, but the wall itself is the most visible aspect of this. Um, it's uh, about 1,200 feet in length, uh, about 12 to 15 feet high. Uh, it, it has very unique features to it. Not your typical wall that a utility might build, but it, it's a result of a lot of public input. So we had a lot of public meetings. What we want this thing to look like, it's high profile, high visibility, it's a major, it's one of the major, major gateways into the city. So we came up with the idea of more of a curved wall that, uh, that imitates sort of the flow of waves or river, if you will, and stay on that theme. The other aspect of it, of it is, is it has relief features to it, so it's sort of three-dimensional, if you will, not just a plain old concrete wall. Another aspect of it will be that it will be um, stained an appropriate color, um, and that will add a nice feature to it. Plus, there's even more that we're doing. Um, we are putting a retaining wall on top, a, a retaining fence, if you will, on top, and be aesthetically easy. We'll put landscaping across the top of the see, and it will be a lighted feature, so the lighting cascades down over the wall. So as you come into the city, you'll now see a very attractive wall, lighted, enhancing the views you come into town. In addition, we'll have a roadway at the base of the wall itself. The roadway primarily will be for access to, if we need to repair a line or something along that line. Somewhere down the road, eventually, it may be part of the extension of the, the Greenway within the city. This project, if you drive along Veterans Parkway, you have no doubt seen evidence of this work, maybe you wondered what was going on. This is what's going on. Uh, give us an update on timing of when this when the wall and the, inter the intercept will be complete. Initially, when we began the project back in January, we thought it would take close to 18 months to two years to do, but the contractors really made tremendous progress. They're telling us that uh, it could be the end of this year whenever it's completed. In fact, if you've driven along there, you'll see a tremendous amount of rebar already in place. Um, and so I'm hopeful that that is it. Weather has been very cooperative. Uh, if we run into some, some wet, rainy weather, it'd be the first part of next year, but fairly soon. We'll Many, many months ahead of state. So we look forward to a break the gateway into our downtown in just uh, a few short months. Another component of B SLU, and again, B SLU has many components to it, uh, but is a requirement to build a new affluent pump station that would be affluent with the E. <laughs> just think about that. Uh, it may hit you after lunch, I don't know. Uh, but it has to be built at the site of where Kids Kingdom is. Uh, describe why that is the case. Well, um, <clears throat> effluent is really the flow that comes from the wastewater treatment. If we've cleaned everything up that you guys send to us, we clean it up and send it back out to the river. Um, but it, it is, um, it has to travel there by a sewer line. The, the treatment plants, are, I don't know if you know this, the treatment plants were built in, in 1955. So those sewer lines that go to the river were built back that far, way before the current Kids Kingdom. And it just so happens that the line that goes to the river runs right through the middle of Kids Kingdom. It's the only spot that we have to build the F1 pumping station. And so let's describe a little more about uh, the pumping station. Yeah, I think one thing, one thing, you'll get the note really quickly here. We, we challenge the utility to think beyond what we're leaving below the ground, below the, beyond the technical requirements, but we want nice amenities above the ground within our financial capacity. I think if you look at this, these renderings uh, and think about the wall that we just described, you'll see why we're proud of the work that we're doing. Well, this is where I wish I had eyes in the back of my head so I could see what's on the screen here. But, um, it, it is, um, it represents uh, really multi-purpose facilities that we'll be building in what is currently Kids Kingdom. And let me describe some of the things you're looking at here. The building itself is a, is a multi-purpose building. The actual pumping station will be um, 20, 30 feet underground uh, with very large pumps that have a capacity to pump about 68 million gallons per day. And typically that would be if a rain event is occurring. Um, above that, then, we will uh, put our, our, one of our laboratories in that building and have, actually have people on site there and even have it where you can display and see the work that's happening in the laboratory. And then in addition, we will have um, open space for educational purposes, things that deal with science and technology and math and engineering and even things that are sort of artistic in nature to describe the work the utility does. 
Uh, another neat feature, which I don't know if you can see, is on top it will be an observation deck that the public can walk up to and you can have a view of the river from there, which is phenomenal. The, the other part of it is, is you have to send the water to the river and one of the challenges that we ran into in thinking through the design is, is, is we can't go through the levee. The Corps of Engineers won't allow us to do that. So we came up with the idea of going over the levee, which led to saying, well, what about a waterfall? What might that look like? Well, if we're going to go to a waterfall, which is very large in nature, can we make a feature there where the public could enjoy that amenity? And so the idea at this point is a cantilevered uh, deck, if you will, that reaches out over the waterfall. That waterfall is probably 20 feet in width, to give you some idea, dimension there. It'll be protected on each side by concrete walls. So, um, but then just a great observation deck just from that view. And then it, it, it takes a fairly large area of land, as you can see from, <clears throat> um, from the illustrations here. So let's talk about the timeline of this. This has to go to bid in January of 2019. You're right. So we still have a lot of design work to do on this. Uh, these are the early on renderings and that are really a result of uh, numerous uh, public input meetings that was facilitated by Leadership Evansville. Perhaps some of you had an opportunity to do that. In fact, we had one at the park itself to talk about some of the concepts. So this has been evolving for some time. So for the next year, Probably uh, early fourth quarter or so of 2018, then we'll be ready to go to bid for construction. It's a very large scale project um, that will take a long time to build, but we'll get it out to bid, and it has to be bid by January 1st. We'll probably get it bid before then. Uh, due to the nature of the project, it will take several months before the contractor is able to mobilize, uh, which is going to impact a fairly large area there. And would we? give these deadlines, these deadlines are all part of a consent decree. So we have to live by these. This is what the EPA judges us by in terms of our compliance with uh, the agreement. Um, a, a major element of uh, the rework Kids Kingdom is to create uh, usable, safe, connected green space uh, from what is essentially the tip of the uh, museum parking lot to the levee authority building. So to do that, we're contemplating reworking Waterworks Road. Uh, you will still have complete access if you're coming in from Henderson or if you're coming in from Moore County or the east side. So, Alan, let's talk a little bit about what we're looking at here and why we need this. Well, a couple of illustrations uh, that we'll walk through, but obviously we're talking about having to reroute Waterworks Road. And, and, a, and a key reason behind that is, is um, is all of our major infrastructure flows from the water filtration plant down Waterworks Road. All the water that you drink comes in that pathway. There are major lines there as well as there's major sewer lines through there. With the construction project, it will result in closing down Waterworks Road. So um, even for the, a very long construction period, it could take uh, up to two years to do. Um, so rather than just close it down and reopen it back up, we said let's open it up so we've got green space there, utilize the space, um, and then reroute Waterworks Road a little bit further um, towards the levee, not quite that far. We don't have the exact route, but we're working through that today. It would come out then to Veterans Memorial Parkway, have a new entrance there, and you would be able to uh, turn right or left, um, and, and a new light would be put in place there. Then. So one of the few complaints that we get into the City Hall uh, is the rate of traffic uh, that flows through the streets, and uh, one of those uh, streets we get complained about is Veterans Parkway. So we think this will do a couple things. One, it will provide the assistance that the utility needs to access its projects, but it will also slow traffic as it comes into the city. Uh, we do intend right now to keep the intersection open at Shawnee. So if you live if you're living on Sunset or back on First, you still have full access into the downtown or to go east. Um, or south, whatever direction you want to call that. Um, and then when you come out, if you're coming from Henderson or if you live uh, up at Harbors, at Harbors Point, you can come down, turn either right, right or left. So we're, we're excited about this prospect, but uh, this will ensure, this is the affluent pump station here, so this gives you an idea of the connectivity of the green space that we're considering. Uh, and if you look back to some of our uh, visioning sessions with Leadership Evansville, one of the big buckets that people talked about 
some of the big ideas was large connected green spaces. <laughs> Definitely what you see here, in my opinion, has a wow factor to it. It's very attractive. It, 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 is a, it becomes a destination. Uh, not only for the, the grounds around um, the F1 pumping station, but the waterfall that we're talking about. That'll continue to evolve. In addition, what we'll explore as we're, as we're looking at designing the road, we'll, we'll look and see if we can extend the, the greenways, uh, walkway, if you will, so that your sidewalks that would go along Veterans Memorial Parkway turn and follow the new road and loop back to, to the uh, sort of the trail where the ends today, Greenway ends today. Lastly, let's talk about Bee Slough's wetland project. This is a huge deal, and the EPA really had difficulty wanting to accept this concept. Talk about where it is and the importance of it. Um, the wetland is, um, it's a, called a constructed wetland, and it's using natural technologies to uh, process or treat wastewater, if you will. Um, and uh, it's a very large-scale project. It's currently in what, what would be considered a ponding area by the Corps of Engineers today. Uh, we'll utilize somewhere between 20 and 25 acres of that, uh, actually build a constructed wetland. Um, the flow that comes in from a Long Beach Slough will be rerouted over there. Uh, one of the projects that we have to build first in order to do that is a, is a large pumping station to push the water through that wetland area. It's a 200 million gallon a day capacity, so it's a very large pumping station. Um, and then once it flows through, the plants do their work, uh, the settling basins do their work, it will then go through a high rate disinfection treatment process and then it will travel on the river from there. And timeline on the wetlands? Time, timeline on the wetlands is uh, we have to have it bid um, by January 1st, 2023. And then the estimated construction timeline on it is in the neighborhood of three years. So by 2025, that would be completed. Um, and then there's another project as you as you looked at the uh, entrance into the city. Uh, you see the beginning of V Slough, the concrete channel there. We're actually going to be covering that sometime in 2021 or so uh, with a, a large sewer line under that. So that then will be a grassy area. So the whole complexion of East Slough over the next less than a decade is just going to change dramatically. And reduce, eliminate the smell. It will eliminate the smell and it will apply the water out. No more stinky sloughs. That's a good note to end on for you. <laughs> Okay, as I said, Kelly Coors could not be with us today, but city engineer Brent Schmidt, uh, who does not have the cool socks on, uh, is in the middle hot seat. Uh, Brent, you probably closed more streets because of the projects you're working on than just about anyone else. They all thank you. <laughs> Let's start with what I think is the most transformational, you know, they're always, it's a contest. Uh, let's start with what I think is the most transformational project for our region since the opening of USI, and that's the Multi-Institutional Health Science and Research Center. Uh, construction's moving right along, uh, anticipated to be completed this spring, ready for classes uh, next August, as has been uh, contemplated all, all along. But there's a lot to this project, more than just this really cool building, uh, like streetscapes. So talk about the medical school streetscapes. So currently our contractor is focused on the section of Fifth Street between Maine and Locust, and they have completed laying the permeable pavers and the driving lanes. Uh, those permeable pavers will allow the rainwater to uh, slowly filter and infiltrate back into the groundwater table, also helping to reduce added uh, charge on the combined sewer system downtown. And so they have the pavers to the intersection of the Fifth and Locust complete in the roadway. They are working currently on the pavers that go in the parking lanes, and those should be completed by the end of the day today or early Monday morning when they will come in and start laying all of the pavers in the crosswalks in the full intersection of Fifth and Locus. Uh, we're really excited and hopeful that, uh, barring any further weather setbacks, that our subcontractor will come in and pave Locust Street um, around November 6th. And after that, then we can have uh, Locust reopen from 4th to 6th and 5th Street from Maine to Locust. And at that point in time, then those streetscape projects will move to the true interior of the medical campus, the four-block quadrant of Walnut between 4th and 6th and 5th between 
Locust and the Deaconess Downtown Clinic. And so it should it should really help uh, alleviate some of those closures. So when you say November 6th, and that sounds like a long way away, but November's next week. That's correct. Just yeah. so everyone knows. Uh, and if anyone, here's another shameless plug. Uh, Children's Museum, never been closed. If you like to take your kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews, uh, they'd love to have you. So uh, anyway, they have uh, been very patient, as have a lot of businesses uh, in that area. We're grateful for everyone's patience and uh, more to come. We have other streetscapes downtown that are looking quite nice. That is correct. If you've had the opportunity to go downtown and enjoy the new uh, Doubletree Hotel, you will see the, the first phase of the streetscapes out in front of the hotel there, a cycle track was constructed, as well as brand new sidewalks and the roadway rebuilt with uh, rain gardens, which also uh, collect storm water and the plants that are in those help filter that water before it infiltrates back into the groundwater table. And we also completed streetscapes uh, down 6th Street and down Cherry Street between 4th and 6th uh, along the backside of the Deaconess Downtown Clinic. Those were completed uh, substantially in February, and final touches are, have been wrapped up over the last month. If you haven't been down there in a while, and I get it because a lot of streets are closed, I've heard that a little bit, uh, you might notice that the old Town Square Media Building has been torn down. So it's this mud, muddy site. So just like in early October, there was a building that housed five radio stations right there. Uh, about this time next year, a new roughly 100,000 square foot building will be in construction that will house clinical research related to the medical school. There will be some clinical research in the medical school, but this other building will also house some clinical research as well as another corporately approved but not announced yet uh, development that will go right in here. So look for more development uh, really of that entire four and a half block section in the next few years, but it's all progressing just as we hoped it would actually maybe a little faster than we hoped. Uh, let's jump to North Main Street. Uh, we're really proud of this complete street project. Uh, it's got a hard, fast completion deadline, November 19th. Uh, it will be done by November 19th because that's the Christmas parade. <laughs> it will be done by the Christmas parade. So Brent, why don't you describe the North Main Street complete street project? So the North Main project consists of truly a revitalization of the city's right of way from Division all the way up to Garvin Park at Bossy Peak. Uh, everything that had been there prior was removed. You have brand new sidewalks. You have the city's first uh, cycle track that in the commercial portion of the, of the corridor is uh, at grade with the roadway and buffered by a curb. And then as it moves into the residential portion of north of Maryland Street, it becomes a, a shared use path on the east side of Main Street and the west side still maintains on-street parking and that on-street parking in those areas are also permeable pavers uh, so we have the ability to help take again take stormwater off of the combined sewer system in that area um, helping UWSU and the city meet its obligation for the consent decree and you know it will be done by the 19th uh, functionally there are a few minor appurtenances, such as uh, trash cans and benches that will still have to be put in with plannings to be done afterwards. But so do we need volunteers to take trash cans out? <laughs> exactly. no, so we'll, we'll, we'll get taken here. No. Uh, I like that answer. Uh, so if you're out on North Main Street right now and you think, man, this seems a little rough, it's not done. It may seem like it's done, but explain sort of the, the, the last layer. So the base and intermediate layers of asphalt, so the first two layers of asphalt are complete. Uh, the contractor then came back in and installed uh, the very attractive uh, brick crosswalks in throughout the corridor. And hopefully the uh, second week of, uh, towards the end of the second week of November, so around uh, 8th, 9th, 10th, We'll have our paving contractor come in and put the last inch and a half on, so there will not be ramps at every intersection. It'll be one nice smooth roadway to, to drive down the corridor. Good answer. <laughs> okay, Brent, thank you very much. Thank We're going to talk briefly about another exciting uh, part of the down of, 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 of the city. That's Haney's Corner. As you may, may know, it's really enjoyed uh, a nice uh, comeback, if you will, in the last several years, both with both with nightlife and, and housing. In fact, thanks to Kelly Coors and his team and DMD, their uh, housing is really making a 
strong comeback. There's strong demand for new housing starts in the Hades Corner area. The most recent homes that have been constructed down there with no subsidy. No subsidy. That really tells you how much activity there is and how much drive there is and demand for housing uh, in Hades Corner. Uh, if you haven't been to a First Fridays, uh, we're out of the First Friday season, but it is a blast. It's really, it's a great, great section of the city. Before we move on to talk to Brian, I want to give a, a plug to Chambers and the, uh, Josh uh, Armstrong, standing over there, just put his eyeglasses back on. Uh, Josh heads the Downtown Alliance for the Chamber and is working to establish the Economic Improvement District, or the EID. And uh, this is a real key component of the most recently updated downtown master plan. Uh, this is the EID area. So essentially, property owners would pay a slightly higher uh, tax for increased services that cannot really be provided by the city. Uh, but Josh and his team have done a phenomenal job to get us to this point. The city council will consider the request uh, to approve the EIDs in their November meetings. So uh, we would encourage you to encourage them to support that. But we think that is a great tool to help us implement uh, the downtown master plan. So Josh, thank you very much for your great work. Here. Okay, more quality of life stuff. Brian, you're up. Um, talk about Kids Kingdom a little bit. Uh, I know a lot of people were understandably upset when the news broke that Kids Kingdom was going to have to, to close, but I think our team, and it's, it's a big team, has done a really good job of making lemonade out of lemons. Um, why don't you describe uh, the look of the process of the, of the new park and the process? Thank you, Mayor. So uh, I think what Alan said uh, originally about the whole destination location and it's changing its uh, landscape is true about Kids Kingdom. And so we heard from everyone about the desire to keep it open. We know that there are over 100,000 visitors to that park in a given year. So we looked at different locations and one of the, the ideal spot is that area between that you're seeing between the museum parking lot and the uh, levy authority uh, pump station. And so last week, uh, the designers, the original designers, uh, Leather and Associates from uh, New York, worked, uh, came to town and worked with us. Uh, Chief Billy Bolin and uh, Lieutenant Paul Kirby were the driving force behind the original Kids Kingdom. And uh, it didn't take much twisting of arms to get them back on board and to help with the project. So they're, they're involved as well. Leathers came in and met with uh, six different elementary schools this past week. This is really a cool process. With Kids Kingdom One went through the same planning process because we wanted to hear from the real playground experts and not a bunch of adults who think they know a lot about playgrounds. <laughs> exactly. So we uh, obviously asked those experts, and the children came forward with some wonderful ideas. One of the thing, one of the things we heard over and over again was that it'd be all inclusive that there would be uh, amenities, there would be opportunities regardless of age or regardless of abilities, that it would be a place for families to come. So we listened to that. We gave that information to the designers and then last Thursday they were able to give us an initial uh, design or drawing of what they envisioned the game to look like. So when this big kid met with the designers, uh, I really suggested it had to have two things. One that it be accessible to people of all ability, and that it had to have at least one view of the Ohio River. So, so they, did they listen to the big kid? They did listen to the big kid. Another good answer. I like these answers. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, we have both. So the highest point in the proposed Kid Kingdom, Kids Kingdom,